Right now, she is being protected by a rigged system. It's a totally rigged system. I've been saying it for a long time. You can't review 650,000 new emails in eight days. You can't do it, folks. Hillary Clinton is guilty. She knows it. The FBI knows it. The people know it. And now it's up to the American people to deliver justice at the ballot box on November 8th. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that was Donald Trump's reaction yesterday to the news that uh, FBI uh, head James Comey had uh, flipped once again and uh, sent another letter to Congress and said that uh, he's sticking by his July assessment in the Hillary Clinton case. Joining us now is Alan Dershowitz, legendary Harvard Law professor and author of Electile Dysfunction, a guide for unaroused voters. Uh, there's the book. I don't know if there are any, any pictures in there for the... Um, for the unaroused voters, Alan? <laughs> Absolutely not, except the cover, which obviously is a, a clever design. It was a great title. It's a wonderful title. I think it's great. Okay, uh, let, let, me, let me ask you your, your take on the news that broke uh, yesterday. Well, first of all, uh, Donald Trump is, is wrong as a matter of fact. The FBI can review hundreds of thousands of emails. They're only trying to determine two things. One, are they duplicates? That they can do by a simple mechanical device uh, through a computer technology that they have. And the second, they can, by looking at uh, headings and, and having thousands of agents review, determine whether or not the content is personal or relates to government. And I urge them to do that, actually, on the air several times. When Comey made his announcement about 10 days ago, I said there's no way that should be left unresolved before the election. They should take as many agents as they need and go over the emails and at least determine two things. N number one, whether there's anything new or whether these are duplicates, or two, whether there's anything relevant to the investigation. And they did that, and they came out, and they announced it. And I think he's helped a little bit to the repair the damage he's done. But the basic damage is that the FBI should be the silent investigative branch of the government. We should never hear from them. We shouldn't even know anything about their internal behavior. All announcements should be made by the Justice Department, not by the FBI. So Comey was wrong in July. He should never even have announced that they weren't prosecuting Hillary Clinton. Just should have said the, 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 the Justice Department should have made whatever announcement it wanted to make. And then he shouldn't have made the July announcement, shouldn't have made the 10-day-ago announcement. And unfortunately, he was compelled to make this announcement. And then the worst problem is he's a good man, uh, Jim Comey, but he doesn't seem to be able to control his agents in terms of leaking. They are now leaking information, which is against the law. And so once this election is over, we're going to have to revisit the FBI situation and figure out a way of plugging these leaks, because whether it's Democrats who are being attacked or Republicans, it's unhealthy when the FBI leaks information. All right, well, let me have, fair enough, but let me ask you about the Justice Department. When the Attorney General sits on the tarmac with the former president, who is part of the Clinton Foundation, which may or may not have been under investigation and is the husband of the, uh, of the woman who, is being, uh, who was under investigation, uh, at two days before Comey makes his announcement, uh, and, and there's more. I mean, but, but just on that alone, uh, yeah. do, we need, do we need to also take a look at the Justice Department when the election's over? Absolutely, and I wrote a piece about that today that will appear on Newsmax and other sites, in which I say when this election is over, we have to divide the function of attorney general into what many Western democracies do. The minister of justice, basically, who is the political advisor of the president. She can meet with whoever she wants. She's a political person. And then the director of public prosecution, an independent office that has nothing to do with the minister of justice, civil servants, apolitical, and they're the only ones who should decide who to investigate, who to prosecute. England does that. Israel does that. Most of the European countries do that. We have an inherent structural problem by merging the political part of the Justice Department with the law enforcement part of the Justice Department. There must be a Chinese wall a thousand feet high between politics and administration of justice. And we have to stop criminalizing political differences, whether it be the indictment of Congressman DeLay and the former governor of Texas, uh, Rick Perry, or whether it be accusations against uh, Hillary Clinton. If you disagree with somebody, don't vote for them. But the idea of turning every policy difference into a crime 
is happening primarily because the Justice Department has become too politicized. And, and what about this relationship between John Podesta and Peter Kadzik? Uh, you know, Podesta uh, used Kadzik as his attorney during the Monica Lewinsky uh, situation. He said that he uh, wrote in WikiLeaks at one point that he kept, or he once said that he kept me out of jail. And now he's an assistant attorney general, and we have evidence of emails going from Kadzik to uh, Podesta talking about upcoming hearings involving Hillary. They went out to lunch or dinner, reportedly, according to an email now, uh, after she testified before the Benghazi committee. Uh, I mean, is a relationship like that acceptable? No, it's not. And it's neither acceptable when it's on the Republican or Democratic side. The Republicans have done exactly the same thing. I was involved in a case in Boston where the Republican-appointed U.S. attorney had improper meetings with lobbyists for the people who were under investigation. This is a systemic problem, and it shouldn't be turned into only a political problem because it's as bad on the Republican side as the Democratic side. We need to have a full-time independent prosecutor, full-time, not just appointed for a particular case, but the entire office should be independent of politics. And we shouldn't have former people who are aligned in politics, either on the Democratic side or the Republican side, appointed to these investigative and, and, and prosecutorial roles. They should be civil servants who are outside of politics. They should be covered by the Hatch Act. And there should be no merger between the political and the administration of justice. And that's a dis it's a disgrace, no matter which side it happens on. What about Terry McAuliffe? There was a story over the weekend that, uh, in fact, it's more like 60,000 uh, felons that he has uh, given a, a, an executive order, given the right to vote in Virginia, as opposed to a much lesser number than what was originally uh, thought. Do uh, you have a problem with that, with that as well? I think all former felons who have served their time in prison should be allowed to vote. Uh, they are not denied their citizenship. I think it's a mistake to take people's voting rights away because they've been convicted of a crime. Now, they shouldn't vote while they're in prison. Okay. But once they've been rehabilitated, once they've been released, I mean, I know people who are living the most distinguished lives in business, and they can't vote because 30 years ago, as a kid, they were convicted of a felony. It's an absurd argument, and it should go across the board. And after this election, we should have legislation all over the country restoring the right to vote to people who have been convicted of crimes as long as they stay out of trouble. But is it the way to do it? I mean, do you have a problem with the way uh, uh, Terry McAuliffe, of course, a former Clintonite, did it on the eve, uh, you know, leading into a presidential election in a state that is certainly uh, very vital? I think it's a problem when you have a governor involving himself, whether it be the, the, you know, what happened in Florida during Bush versus Gore, when the Republican state attorney uh, or, or secretary of state was involved in the election. It's always a problem on the Democratic and Republican side when politicians try to determine who can vote and who can't vote or how to count votes or how many uh, uh, people should be uh, barred from voting. It's always a problem on either side of the calculus. We tend to focus on whichever side we don't like, but we have to look at this institutionally and structurally. All right, let's talk about uh, a guy, uh, the, uh, the, the book, Electile Dysfunction. Here we are uh, a day away from the election. Uh, talk about something that people who, uh, who read your book might have learned or might learn if they haven't read it yet, and what you think might happen tomorrow. With all, with all due pride, I predicted everything. In the last <laughs> section of the book, I said this is going to be a much closer election than it then appeared. I wrote it in August when Clinton looked like she was way ahead. I said you can't ever use the polls to predict a Brexit-type vote with emotion. Number one, you can't ever determine Trump because you don't know what he's going to do in the future. You don't know what Clinton has done in the past, and you don't know enough about voter turnout. And so all of those things have coalesced, and we see an election that became closer even before Comey made his ill-advised statement 10 days ago. So we're also seeing, as I wrote in the book, the vast majority of Americans, yesterday in 60 Minutes, they had a segment, the vast majority of Americans are not voting for a candidate. They're voting against the candidate. This is the first time in modern American history that so many people are voting negatively. I start my book with a button that's being sold around the country. Everybody sucks, 2016. <laughs> and that's the attitude that so many people have. It's a very unhealthy situation. And we have to start thinking now about the day after the election, how to bring people together. Much harder to do it when the divides are racial, gender, ethnic, religious, 
uh, class, uh, education. These are much harder divides to bring together. And I think the key is going to be whoever wins the election must be gracious. Whoever loses the election must acknowledge the loss and must urge everybody to work together with uh, the new president. So there's a lot of burden on both candidates. Whoever wins or loses this election, they both have to act to heal. And remember Lincoln's phrase with malice to none and charity to all. Let's try to rebuild the country. Alan Dershowitz, always great to talk to you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. All right, folks. Uh, coming up next, give me five. And you're not going to want to miss that because Barack Obama has been in rare form, not only in, in, in my interpretation saying it's okay for illegals to vote, but on the campaign trail, what he's been saying and how he's been acting, you're going to see it next. Don't miss it.